we have just discussed the uh, how to solve the IS curve in the uh, goods market equilibrium uh, from, from that perspective. Then we move on to the money market equilibrium uh, conditions. In the money market, uh, that is the other side of the ISLM market uh, model. Remember, the uh, money supply is determined by the central bank, right? So, uh, so we are not going to uh, model the money supply itself as a, a, a function of interest rate or, or outcome. However, demand for money is a function. The demand for money is a function in our perspective, uh, the Keynesian perspective, is a function of both interest rate and output. And more particularly, the demand for money is, a positive, uh, is positively related to income and negatively related to, uh, to the real interest rate. And so if we solve for the real interest rate it, as an equation from uh, from 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 the money market equilibrium, then you can see that the uh, slope of the curve relating the real interest rate to output is also positive h over q. So that's the LM uh, equation. When I put now, we have solved for the IS curve as a function as as relating. Uh, two variables, two key variables in the macroeconomy, right? GDP, the real GDP, Y, and the real interest rate. Those are the key, the two key variables that we are looking at in this particular model of the Keynesian economy. And uh, one thing I should repeat is that uh, this analysis is, is known as the demand side analysis, right? We are looking at everything here from the demand side. Um, so you have now that we have a way to determine equilibrium condition uh, and solving for these two key variables, output, the real GDP, and the real interest rate, okay, in, in the model. So uh, from the uh, goods market side, we have the uh, determination of the IS equation and the IS curve. And from the money market side, we have the determination of the LM uh, uh, equation or the LM curve. When I put them together, when you look at the, uh, the equations, well, this should not surprise you. The IS curve is downward sloping and the LM curve is upward sloping. Okay, from the perspective of these two equations that we just saw, there's a negative relationship between output and real interest rate, and there's a positive relationship between output and real interest rate in the money market, whereas the negative relationship is in the goods market. And so you can see here the equilibrium in the ISLM model is what's represented here with uh, equilibrium uh, interest rate being at R1 and equilibrium output being at Y1, right? So that intersection determines uh, the two, as I said, the two key variables that we are looking at, macroeconomic variables that we are looking at and in this particular model, okay? Now, once you have established this, <coughs> excuse me, um, you are now, able to conduct experiments, policy, policy experiments, all right? So we are going to, uh, this is what we are going to do. Uh, we had started doing, we showed it mathematically. And now we are combining both. We can show it mathematically and we can show it graphically as well, right? So suppose, uh, uh, we are asking ourselves, what could what could the government do here to affect either output or real interest rate? In any case, the economy, right? Um, policymakers have three levers that they can use. Okay, one is government expenditure, 
that's G, that's a tool. The other one is taxes. That is a, a, another fiscal policy tool, right? So government can change expenditure and or it can change taxes in order to affect the economy. And, and we'll see the conditions. The other tool in terms of policy is monetary policy. And in our perspective, uh, the, uh, the lever that the government has here in terms of monetary policy is the supply of money represented by M. Okay? So we can, in uh, this model, uh, now we can analyze the effect, the impact on the economy uh, when government changes one or the other of these uh, particular policy tools. All right, so let's first look at uh, fiscal policy, okay? Uh, and suppose the government increases G, okay? Suppose government increases G. Now, uh, in order to understand what the effect would be, let's go back to the equation. You can see G here in this equation uh, is entering into the equation in a uh, positive, okay, with a positive slope, but it is here in the, uh, in the equation as part of the autonomous expenditures, if you like, right? Uh, uh, and, and so it doesn't change the slope of the curve, okay? So, but the, an increase in G, you see, would cause the entire uh, equation, the entire system to go up. But in, in terms of graphical terms, it goes up in a uh, uh, meaning shifting, of course, right? In a, in a parallel fashion, okay? So IS curve shifts to the right. And so you're going to see that income would go up along the IS, right? Between the, uh, the equilibrium point, right? If you project that equilibrium point, the point to the, to the new IS curve, the red IS curve, then of course there's an increase in, 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 in income. When income goes up, people mean they have money now, right? Let's think about it, they have money in their pocket. So what do you do when you have money in your pocket? Uh, you are going to, uh, your income goes up, you're gonna to want to go and uh, uh, spend some money. Um, you might also want to hold some money. Uh, in any case, the demand for money goes up. And so when the demand for money goes up, interest rate will go up. Okay, interest rate will go up. And so when interest rate goes up, what happens in our equation again is that, let me go back here. When interest rate goes up, look at the last equation to the left, right? When interest rate goes up, there's a negative relationship. Investment goes down a bit. So because investment goes down a bit, right? Then you work yourself towards the new equilibrium uh, which establishes it itself at the cross between the new IS and the LM. Remember the LM curve is not changing because it is not uh, a money supply side that is changing. It is uh, here, the fiscal side, the uh, government expenditure that is changing, increasing uh, because it has increased, income goes up, but because income goes up, demand for money goes up along the LM curve, it causes uh, a, a, a reduction in investment, and therefore you end up at a, an equilibrium at Y2 and R2, a higher interest rate, but a higher output. If I put it all together, what does that mean? It means that when government increases purchases, yes, there will be an increase, uh, an accumulated increase in uh, output, but the downside of that is that it raises uh, interest rate, okay, in the economy. Um, if we were, we were talking about the full uh, demand side model and aggregate demand, aggregate, and then uh, uh, combined with the supply side, aggregate supply, if we were discussing that full model, you would see that this is uh, also uh, an issue 
uh, that is concerning when government goes, uh, expenditure goes up, will that cause inflation or not? And if you are following uh, the current discussion in the United States, this is going on as we speak, as government is considering uh, you know, substantial amount of investments and there is worries uh, in the, the government policy circles, whether or not it would reinforce the inflationary uh, impact that are already present. So this is actually very uh, applicable, okay, in, in, uh, in, in real world settings. What does a tax cut now do? So the government, uh, suppose the other side of uh, fiscal policy, the other fiscal policy too, suppose that in this case, the government uh, uh, reduces taxes, right? So uh, the, the reduction in taxes will raise consumption. Why? You remember consumption is a function of disposable income. If you reduce taxes, your disposable income goes up and therefore consumption goes up. And if you remember the process we went through before that cycle, when consumption goes up, income goes up, right? So, uh, you know, so a higher income once again, just like you saw in the slide before, means that uh, the demand for money goes up, interest rate goes up, uh, investment reduces. So it brings down the income a bit from one, right? So if you look at the distance, at one, it's not the final resting point. The resting point for output is a bit less than what it would have been if there was no change in R. So, but because R goes up, the interest rate goes up as a result of the demand for money, quantity demanded of money going up. And therefore what happens is investment responds uh, by going down and reduces the change in income somewhat. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, a tax cut in this model causes output to go up, even though the downside is uh, an increase in uh, interest rate. Okay, now, this, what we just talked about, okay, uh, uh, particularly when government uh, is is increasing expenditures. Uh, it's an example of what's known as uh, the crowding out effect, right? Uh, so when government is increasing its expenditure, reducing taxes, et cetera, what happens is that uh, in, in, uh, real output goes up, but also real interest rate goes up as we saw here and as we saw here, okay? So in both cases, whether government is increasing uh, government purchases, reducing taxes, output goes up, but interest rate also goes up from R1 to R2 in both cases. What does that mean? The higher interest rate leads to lower investment spending, right? The higher interest rate leads to lower investment spending. So what has happened in economics, what we say is that by raising its expenditures, government has uh, caused a, 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 an increase in interest rate. And because of that, so the, the increase in real interest rate is a function, is a result of the change in government expenditure. And because of that, private sector, right, has less access to loanable funds in the economy and therefore investment goes down. This is known as government crowding out the private sector, right? government crowding out the private sector. So it's, a, it's known as the crowding out effect, okay? So um, once again, you can, you, you can just represent that along this uh, so, sort of, uh, 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 now we are going to look at uh, the, how 
the marginal propensity to consume affects the crowd out effect. So, uh, in other words, how far, right? How far the income ends up at the new equilibrium is a function of the marginal propensity to consume. Okay is a function of the margin of propensity to consume that we saw before, right? So the reduction in investment, okay? The reduction in, uh, in Y compared to a situation where there was no change in real interest rate. So please uh, uh, follow me. First, there's an increase in government expenditure or reduction taxes. At that point, real interest rate stays at R1. The um, economy uh, sees IS curve, right, higher demand. So the IS curve shifts to the right. If there was no change in real interest rate, we, the, the number one there, right, that distance one would have been the total change in Y. But we don't end up at number one, we end up, right, at the red Y2. And the reason is that interest rate goes up as a result. And so investors reduce their investment. That relative contraction, relative to what would have happened if there was no change in R, is determined by the margin of propensity. Uh, right? Uh, so consumers save. Uh, it, their income or they consume their income. They say, uh, so when you reduce taxes, consumers will actually save some of it, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, right? They're not going, we are showing here, okay? And so the final effect is smaller than what it would have been, okay? If people didn't save. And remember, we, the numerical example that we gave before, I said so, that at the end of the day term, right, the effect, right, of a change in taxes is smaller than equal, right, change in, uh, in government expenditure. So if you, in our numerical example, just to remind you, we set the marginal propensity consumed to 0.8. Uh, a $1 increase in government expenditure uh, causes a $5 increase in output, but a $1 decrease in uh, taxes would have caused a $4, uh, uh, a $4 increase in output. So for the same, the same uh, equal change in taxes or uh, in government expenditure, the effect uh, uh, on the tax side, the result is smaller than on the government expenditures. Now let's look at monetary policy. Okay. So, what do we mean? We mean by monetary policy. Monetary policy has to do with the central bank's decisions, decision to change uh, the quantity of money. Okay, remember we said that from the start. Uh, in, in this model, the assumption is that uh, the supply of money is determined by the central bank. So if the central bank uh, is targeting one or the other macroeconomic variable, right? So it could be output, it could be the interest rate, uh, right? So the, uh, the, the Fed, or oh, sorry, the Fed is the central bank in the United States, but the central bank might decide, right, to, uh, to change the money supply. And so uh, how, what do we say about that? An increase in the money supply is known as expansionary monetary policy, right? Um, and so if you are from, uh, uh, from Francophone, uh, Wemu country, uh, you know, Benin, Burkina Faso, Niger, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, uh, et cetera, uh, Mali, et cetera, Senegal, all of those countries share the same, uh, the same currency and the central bank is known as Beseao, okay? Uh, so 
that's a West African Central Bank. If you are from Liberia or you are from Nigeria, Sierra Leone, uh, any other country, Kenya, South Africa, et cetera, uh, your, own, your, your, your countries have their own central bank, okay? That is not common to a region uh, uh, as we speak. So, so, so that's what we mean. So the central bank is a regulator. Right in the money in the in the financial markets, uh, in, uh, in in all affairs that have to do with finance uh, uh, flows of finances and money in the economy, the central bank is essentially the uh, the, the policy regulator and decider, and so central bank may decide for one reason or another to increase the quantity of money. That's the expansion and monetary policy. If they decide again, uh, as they're targeting one issue or another uh, to decrease the quantity of money that is known as contractionary monetary policy. So now let's see what happens when uh, the, the central bank uses monetary policy, okay? So an increase in money supply, an increase in money supply. Uh, so monetary policy, expansionary monetary policy by the central bank. What is the effect? The first effect is that it causes the LM curve to shift downward. Yeah. The LM curve shifts down because of the increase in the money supply. Okay. When the LM curve shifts, okay, you have now more money than before. That's what it means. You have more money in the economy than before. And the cost of money is the interest rate. So if you have more money in the economy than before, the, 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 the price of money, which is the interest rate, goes down. It, because there's, there's a lot more, right? When you have expansionary monetary policy. So the interest rate goes down. When the interest rate goes down, it encourages investment. So investment goes up. And when investment goes up, right, output goes up. So Ceteris Parabus, all else being equal, if you have an increase in the money supply, the LM curve shifts down. The result is that you have a, a, an increase in output and a reduction in interest okay so this is uh this is uh, uh you know clearly from the, the side of uh, uh of money supply okay uh, what is what would happen and you can see here the same uh analysis in the opposite way in other words uh what is happening here is that privacy seeing that there is a reduction in real interest rate, the cost of borrowing goes down when interest rate goes down. And therefore it's easier for the private sector investors to go and borrow money to invest in the economy. This causes output to go up, okay? And, and so, and the central bank can do this, uh, you know, anytime. In other words, right, they can, they, they can increase or they can decrease. If they increase, the money supply output goes up, interest rate goes down. If they decrease the money supply, so you can see the different shifts here, uh, output goes down and uh, interest rate goes up, all right? When the money supply goes down, when the federal, when the central bank decides to reduce the money supply, okay, it causes the interest rate to go up. There's less money available in the economy under those circumstances. Interest rate would go up. When interest rate goes up, the cost of borrowing goes up. Investors have less access to uh, loanable funds and therefore they invest less and therefore output goes down. Okay, that is uh, what that means. Okay, now, so, um, a, a, again, this is another representation of uh, expansionary 
versus contractionary versus when the Fed remains neutral. Okay, so there are circumstances when there's pressure on the central bank uh, to either uh, to intervene in the economy, either to uh, attempt to expand the uh, output, okay, uh, or an attempt to uh, you know reduce the interest rate. So if if the authorities think that. Uh, fiscal policy is not uh, responding, that the economy is not responding to fiscal policy. For example, they may approach the central bank uh, to say, look, you know, um, I'm, in a, I'm in a tight uh, situation now. I need intervention uh, to increase the uh, uh, output, right? So what can you do? Uh, if the central bank agrees, they might increase the supply uh, of money by increasing the supply of money, interest rate goes down, output goes up. And, and the opposite would be true. So it really depends on the target uh, of monetary policy. Okay. All right. So let's uh, look at how this, how these discussions can apply to the real world, right? Um, so in our model, uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy are assumed to be exogenous. Money supply is assumed to be exogenous. Government expenditure is assumed to be exogenous in our model and taxes are assumed to be exogenous. But in reality, in the real world, by right, money, money uh, uh, the central bank monetary policy makers may adjust the supply of money in response to a change in government expenditure. They might do that. And they often, in many countries, they, they will do that. If they think that an increase in government expenditure, for example, is causing the economy to, to heat up quickly, then they might want to put a damp on that uh, by reducing the money supply as a result, as a response. Okay, it's possible. And also try, right, try to control how fast the economy is growing. It's possible. If they think that uh, right, the government uh, uh, fiscal authorities uh, are causing the economy to contract too much because of increase in taxes, uh, the central bank may respond to that in the real world by uh, increasing the supply of money to try again to Counteract. So it depends on uh, the relative uh, uh, interplay uh, forces, the strength of each side of policy, right? Whether uh, the central bank has the autonomy, has the strength, right, to make decisions that are different and that can respond to what uh, fiscal authorities may be doing. Okay. And so uh, if if the, if the central bank has that authority and has that propensity, uh, it would mean that fiscal policy may not be as effective as it could be, uh, as it could be, right? So you can see here, you know, possibly, I, I, as I said before, right? So government uh, on the fiscal side might change expenditure or, uh, or taxes. The central bank may decide Okay, I, no, I'm not going to do anything about this. I'm going to hold uh, uh, money uh, constant, or I'm going to try and target the interest rate to hold it constant. That would mean, right, a, a change in uh, in in the money supply that may be contrary to what the fiscal policy makers are doing, or the uh, central bank may decide to target. Uh, 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 out, output, okay? And so this would be, might have, this interplay may have of between fiscal policy and monetary policy in the same country, and it happens by the way, uh, may end up having contradictory effect on the economy. If there is no uh, understanding and harmony and collaboration between 
fiscal policy authorities, the monetary policy authorities. It's, this is very, very important, right? Uh, so, uh, so, 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 so in some countries, that uh, collaboration, that understanding, that harmony uh, is absent. And therefore, sometimes, right, government may be contradicting itself through its own contradictory policies, okay? Um, and so, so this, this is showing you what would happen, for example, if government uh, on the fiscal side decides to change fiscal policy, sorry, uh, fiscal policy, and here you have the, uh, uh, the, the Fed doesn't do anything, then we have the same thing that we had before. If the Fed doesn't do anything, right? We have the same um, um, uh, impacts that we have seen before. However, right, uh, if the central bank decides that it wants to hold the real interest rate constant after, after government has uh, enacted the fiscal policy, then of course what happens is that at the same time that the IS curve is shifting to the right as a result of increases in government expenditure in basically expansionary fiscal policy, the central bank is also at the same time uh, increasing the money supply, engaging in expansionary right, uh, monetary policy. What this does is that it reinforces the output side, the output effect. So you go from Y1 to Y3 and holds the interest rate constant. It's possible that this could happen in the real world. So then, if that's the case, right, the fiscal authorities are expanding, uh, they uh, are engaging in expansionary fiscal policy. The monetary authorities are, are also uh, uh, engaging in expansionary monetary policy. And so a combination of both of these may result in reinforcing the output impact, the output effect of the combination of both policies, but holding uh, the interest rate constant in this, in this example. And therefore, uh, that there will be no crowding out effect. <laughs> and so you end up, you end up with right, uh, a, a pretty substantial uh, full effect full effect uh, on, on, on output as a result of the combination of both policies as the Keynesian cross theory would predict. Now, in, in case the, um, the central bank is targeting output, right? It's targeting output. Uh, then what would happen is that if there's an expansionary fiscal policy, the central bank will reduce, at the same time, will reduce, right? Would reduce, so expansionary, sorry, expansionary fiscal policy means that the IS curve shifts to the right because an increase in G or decrease in T in taxes, okay? If nothing is done as we saw before, uh, of course the output will go up, the interest will go up, et cetera. But, if the, the central bank is, uh, is keen on holding output constant, then in this case, as a result, as a response, at the same time that the fiscal authorities are engaging in expansionary fiscal policy, the central bank will reduce uh, the money supply causing the LM curve to shift to the left. You can see the green line, okay? When that happens, okay, the result of that is that at the, this new equilibrium, Y, the output does not change. You can see the Y1 remains a Y1 at the end of the day, but the interest rate would go up even further 
to R3. So you can, again, this is where I was talking about harmonization of policies in an economy. This is a case where the fiscal authorities and the monetary authorities are not seeing eye to eye as to uh, what is important uh, to target in the economy at this particular point in time, what they end up doing when they engage, right? If one side of the government is engaging in a policy that is contrary to the other side of the government, what is going to happen is that the economy will suffer. Like here, interest rate that is going up uh, all the way up from R1 to R3, uh, where there is, uh, investors just don't want to touch that and therefore the output does not change at all, which is what the Fed was was targeting, right? right? So this is to say that right, in the real world, uh, it is not ceteris paribus. In the real world, uh, you know, different uh, authorities uh, have to collaborate. Uh, they have to talk to each other, right? So uh, a, a, and one thing that I should make very precise is that when we talk about fiscal authorities, what we mean by that is usually uh, you know, those who have the power to make decisions with respect to expenditure, expenditure or spending and taxes. That usually would be the executive branch and the legislative branch, usually, right? Usually it would be the, right, the, the presidency as executive branch, and, and which means uh, ministers, and, 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 and all of that. And the um, legislative branch, which is the, usually the National Assembly and so on, that have to vote on budgets uh, and, and spending plans and et cetera. So those are usually considered the fiscal authorities. Those are a combination of the decisions between the, uh, the cabinet, the ministers and the presidency and uh, decisions by the National Assembly will result in whether or not you have the increase in government expenditure, changes in taxes, and so on. Those are usually the ones that have the power to do that, to, to raise your taxes, to decrease taxes, to decide to uh, increase expenditure, you know, to set the budget for, uh, for, for each year. The uh, monetary authorities usually would be the central bank authorities. Right, the central bank. So it's a central bank that has the power. Uh, in uh, you know, and uh, in an assumption of no collusion and autonomy and so on, uh, the central bank is the one making the decision with respect to uh, monetary policy. And so when you have a contradiction between uh, one side of the government and the other side of government, and the economy can suffer. So the the, what this discussion is leading to is that in the real world, there's a lot more complicated situation where, where right, different uh, policy makers have to uh, interact, have to harmonize, have to discuss uh, before uh, decisions are made that would have a long-term effect. So this is the end of the uh, second lesson of uh, module one uh, in this uh, macroeconomic modeling uh, course. I thank you for your attention and again, encourage you to go on the site, on the Yen site uh, platform uh, to uh, see uh, and download the narrative and also quizzes that will go along with this, uh, with this uh, module. Thank you very much. Bye.